America went silent today after everyone boycotted everyone else for their opinions and then were fired. Cries of outrage faded away as cries of outrage drowned them out, then faded away as boycotts against the cries of outrage forced everyone to fire everyone who had already fired everyone else after their cries of outrage led to boycotts. Though some defended the First Amendment, they were soon silenced by others who said that while they supported the First Amendment, they drew the line at supporting the First Amendment, which should be boycotted, after which the boycotters should be fired. Outraged Americans then took to Twitter, where they said nothing, fearing a boycott. A spokesman for outraged Americans for boycotts and firing praised the decision to silence everyone and then fell silent after being boycotted by people who were subsequently fired. In the aftermath, you could hear a pin drop until those outraged by the dropping of pins boycotted the pin droppers who were outraged and then fired before firing everyone else. Seems like I'm the last person talking, so let's get started. <laughs> Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, this is a big day. Because not only is it mailbag day, so that all your problems are now over, it is also the day when we begin to release the Left Ease Dictionary, my new series of videos. This is a, the Left Ease Dictionary is something I've been doing since PJ Media Day, so I've been doing it for years. But Jeremy Boring, the god king of the Daily Wire, and I sort of finally said, let's really, let's really put this thing down A to Z. So we we're going to start today with Antifa. We'll play it on the show later on after we talk about Roseanne and everything else. Uh, but we will play it here, and then you can go on YouTube and watch it before they take it down for being hateful and uh, offensive and true. I think that's what it is. Oh, that's true. Let's let's take that down. So A is for Antifa, the first uh, edition of the Lefties Dictionary. I guess we'll be releasing one a week, I think, from now on. Um, so that's excellent. And I want to just say thank you, uh, first of all, to uh, Young Americans for Freedom at UCLA. They hosted me at, at UCLA. We had a really good time and uh, gave us a nice speech. And there was a big police presence. And I want to say thank you so much to the LAPD. They decide when there might be trouble. They, they don't have to be asked. They just come out. And, you know, I live in a town where if you are an actor who pretends to be on the LAPD, you get paid $200,000 a week. If you're an actual officer on the LAPD risking your life to protect those people, not so much. That's, you know, their, their starting salary is around $65,000 a year. So, so I just, I just really appreciated them uh, being there because then, you know, if you, if you pretend to be a police officer, you then win an Emmy and make a speech about how awful policemen are and uh, collect your $200,000 a week. But they're really patient, really uh, great guys. And I really did appreciate it. Lightstream. I know, you know, we all have credit cards. We use our credit cards and we don't read the interest rate on the back of the credit card. But if you let your interest, uh, if you let your debt p- pile up, you start getting charged at a level where they will come and repossess every single thing you own. But Lightstream will get you out of that situation. Lightstream rewards customers who have good credit with great interest rate and no fees. So you can get a credit card consolidation loan from 5.49% APR with AutoPay. You got to use AutoPay. You could save thousands of dollars in interest just by using Lightstream. The application is 100% online and you can even get your funds as soon as today. My listeners get an additional interest rate discount on top of Lightstream's already low rates. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Andrew. That is L-I-G-H-T- L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Andrew. Lightstream dot com slash Andrew. This is subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount available only when you select auto pay prior to loan funding. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com for important information about limits on Lightstream loans and same day funding. I've got to read that. This is important. There is too much silence in America. This, this is just true. There is too much commitment to silence. We are too busy. I'm joking around about it in the opening of the show, but the fact is there's just too much shutting people up. And of course, I'm uh, referring to Roseanne. Each situation has to be taken 
individually, and we have to discuss each situation individually, and I will discuss this individually, but in general, in general, the outrage has got to stop. I mean, it's we are just going to shut e- spend all our time shutting each other up. Instead of arguing, I'd much, much rather we were arguing with each other at the top of our lungs than shutting people up. You know, I do make exceptions. I do say, oh, you know, the NFL, these football players were on field in uniform speaking as if for the NFL and hurting the NFL's business. I understand why they why they silenced them. But but in terms of people's opinions and their you know loudmouth remarks and their offhanded tweets and all this stuff, the sta- let's put it this way. The standard should be freedom. The standard should be tolerance. The standard should be argumentation as opposed to shutting people up. The standard should be, I disagree with you, here's why. That should be the standard. Or, or, you know, I don't like you, I'm not listening to you anymore, or I'm not coming to your store, whatever you want. But the standard should not be shut up. That is really becoming the sort of norm. So let's take the Roseanne situation. You know, I heard about Roseanne being fired the minute I went off the air yesterday. Jacob Airy, one of our, who knows what these people do? God knows what they do for a living, but he works here. And he came running in and told me about this. And he told me about her tweet about uh, Valerie uh, Jarrett, right? This is Obama's, they used to call her the first sister. She was basically his closest advisor and was universally hated. The left hated her, the right hated her. She was blamed everything, something, every time something went wrong in the Obama administration, which was an every day that ended with a Y, she was often blamed for not letting the information get to him. A v- real Chicago operator, not somebody that people like also uh, she was born in Iran, I think it is, and uh, is black. All right. So she, so Roseanne tweets, the Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals that VJ Valerie Jarrett. Okay. So the first thing I thought when I heard this, truly, the first thing that came into my mind, long, long time ago, back in the 1980s, I was still a liberal. All right. I'm still a liberal. Uh, George Steinbrenner owned the Yankees, and George Steinbrenner was Donald Trump. He was a roughneck, he was a loudmouth, and he was a Republican, and so the people, the New Yorkers hated him. They were always picking on him, but he was great at running the Yankees. He really did a good job running the Yankees. I'm sure you've seen him if you ever watched Seinfeld. He's a character in Seinfeld. George Steinbrenner is looking out the window one day at a playground, and he sees kids climbing on what then was called the jungle gym. I think now they call it a climbing frame. And he, he said, oh, that's cute. They look like little monkeys on the, you know, in the trees, you know. And they jumped on this because the kids were black. And they said, oh, he must have been. And I'm a liberal, right? And I thought to myself, wait a minute. The racism there is in the mind of the listener because any parent who has been in a playground watching his kid on a jungle gym, no matter what color he was, has said the same thing. We all say the same thing. They look like monkeys in the trees. That's what they look like. They're hanging around. They're jumping around. They're yelling at each other. And I thought Steinbrenner got nailed. And I thought it was wrong at that moment. However, However, I got to tell you, I know a lot of people who know Roseanne, a lot of people who know her. Next to Harvey Weinstein, uh, the things that they say about Roseanne, I mean, that what an awful human being (laughs) she is, all right? So I am going to take it as read that she meant it this way. And I think she did. I really do. I think it was a, she makes a lot of racist jokes. And I kind of, you know, it's funny. I kind of like racial humor. I thought racial humor was always funny in a way of ex, uh, expending, uh, you know, natural tribal hostility. But I could tell, you can always tell when it crosses a line. You could always tell. I always remember, even as a kid, people would tell me jokes and I would laugh and think that's pretty funny. And then every now and again, uh, you know, <laughs> that's kind of mean, you know, that's kind of mean. So let's, let's just say it was what ABC said it was, that it was abhorrent, okay? Now, does she have to be fired for that? I would have preferred that she wasn't. I would have preferred that she wasn't. But I got to say, ABC has the right. They have the right. I would have preferred. I think there's too much silence in America. I would have preferred they slapped her wrist. Other people, uh, that sportscaster who said that, uh, what did she say about Donald Trump? I can't remember. The sportscaster on ESPN, which is a Disney thing, she said some. I think he was a white supremacist or something like that. They gave her a slap on the wrist. They didn't fire her. They ultimately suspended her for something else that she said. But I thought they could have done that to Roseanne. And, and so my problem, my problem is much bigger than this, okay? My problem is bigger than this. My problem is not Roseanne, right? My problem is last man standing. My problem, what happened to last man standing? It's going to come back on Fox, right? Which is great. But ABC are the ones who canceled that too while it was a hit. And they said, well, there was this, there was that, economic, blah, 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 blah. you know, it was, a, it was a right wing, it was a conservative show. And this uh, Roseanne show had her as a Trump supporter. And because of that, 
it went through the roof. It was a big, big ratings monster. And even though its ratings fell off, it remained a pretty powerful, powerful show. So what I'm saying is, yes, did they have the right to fire her? Was it legal? Sure, of course it was. Did she say something repulsive? Yeah, I think she did say something repulsive. All of that. But that's not what this is about. This is about ABC and the silence. It is about canceling Last Man Standing. I want to see, you want to prove to me it's not about that. Have Disney, who owns ABC, have them release the path to 9-11, okay? The path to 9-11, the story of how we got to 9-11, which the Clintons did everything they could to bury. It was a ratings smash. And one of the things it showed, which is absolutely true, was that Bill Clinton didn't have Osama bin Laden killed when he could have. And that's why Osama bin Laden lived to attack our World Trade Center on 9-11. And Clinton hated this. And the Clinton buddies hated this. And the people who, you know, Iger over at, uh, at Disney, even though this thing was a ratings monster, Path to 9-11, I think at the time it was the biggest, one of the biggest rated uh, miniseries ever. They've never released it on DVD. Never. You cannot get it. You can't get your hands on it. So if this is not about silencing a voice for Trump, right, release it. Release the path to 9-11. If it's not, what happened? You know, you know what? I would settle for this. Say, hey, Roseanne was a horrible person. She said horrible things. We can't work with her. We'll put on another show. We'll put on other shows instead of all our comedians, uh, late night comedians being against Trump, instead of all our shows being against Trump, instead of every time you watch, turn on the show, it's like a hand coming out of the television set and slapping you in the face. We will entertain these people. We're using the public airways. This is FCC controlled air. We will serve the tens of millions of people and entertain the tens of millions of people who voted for the president of the United States. And guess what? There's going to be 10 million more next time. So you really want to get that audience. And so just prove to us, prove to us that this is all it's about. That's what I want to say to ABC. Too much silence over there at ABC when it comes to entertaining the people who voted for and support Donald Trump. And this is the thing. Let me, I I will go on with this for just a minute, but I got to talk about Helix sleep. You know, my my wife went out of town. She's there in New York to uh, celebrate or mourn uh, the, the, the marriage of Michael Knowles and sweet little Alyssa. We've done everything we can to stop it, folks. We really have, but there's nothing we can do. The reason I know she's out of town is because I get to use the Helix pillow. It is so nice. I used it one day. I said, this pillow is great. And she tried it and she said, oh yeah, it's great. And I never saw it again. <laughs> I've never gotten my hands on it. It's so comfortable. And their mattresses, you know, Everybody's different. So why would you get a mattress that is built for just anybody? You want a customized mattress to your specific height, weight, and sleep preferences so you can have the best sleep of your life with Helix Sleep mattresses and pillows. And for people like me who don't sleep, I just get to lie on them and it's incredible, com- incredibly comfortable. Go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin. Huh? How do you spell Clavin? K-L-A-V-A-N. Go right now and you'll get up to $125 toward your mattress order. That's helixsleep.com slash Clavin for up to $125 off your mattress order. Helixsleep.com slash Clavin. These things are incredibly, incredibly comfortable. The pillows and the mattresses, both. Okay, here's the rest of the problem is that they are not, it's not just Roseanne. They will use Roseanne to sell this narrative. And I'm going to talk about why later on in the show, why this narrative is so important to them to tar us all as racists, right? Why that? Why that's the thing they always go for. But they they immediately go on and they blame Trump. It's not Roseanne's fault. She supported Trump. Trump supported her. So it must be all Donald Trump's fault. Do we have that montage? Here's a, here's a montage of the news people relating the story, trying to stick it on Trump. You can't say they understand us or they get us and then now want to be completely divorced from it. You can't say... That will speak volumes. Yeah, and he, he very likely could. I mean, yeah. and, and you can't say there are fine people on both sides. You cannot say racist things, uh, encourage people to, uh, to get punched at your rally. That- people who are racist don't know they're racist. Or they say that they believe that that people are going to believe that they're not racist simply because they say it is. I think we need a crash course in exactly what racism is. And so what we see is this vile conduct by Roseanne Barr. It's not a joke. It is a stone cold racist statement by one of the most prominent public supporters of a 
racist president who time and time again has shown us his true colors and not for the first time at Charlottesville when he lectures the country and he says that, well, there's good Nazis out there. He's attaching himself to Roseanne. Then this is about him, too. This sort of toxic language and opinions are what he's been spewing across the country, and they are taking hold. It started with Roseanne Barr today. Might very well end with Donald Trump tonight. So it's all, it's, it's about Trump, but it's not just about Trump. It's about anyone who voted for Trump. Here's, here is um, uh, cut number 11. Tens of millions of people voted for him after he showed his cards for years. But are you, so suggest, have, are you suggesting that they're racist? or they're, yes. The, yes. The, the people who vote, all the people who voted for Donald Trump are racist. Yes. They may not, they may, may not be violently racist. They may not be, um, um, he's targeted. He's very clear and strategic. Look, anti-blackness is a strategy that has been um, the foundation of part of the American proce- uh, yeah. project. So you heard that logic there, right? Roseanne said something racist because Trump is racist, because you're racist for voting for Trump, because America is racist. That is the left narrative in a nutshell. And that's why, that's why the MSNBC had a panel on racism. Who's there? You know, Al Sharpton Jr. is there. He, one of the biggest anti-Semites in the world, Al Sharpton Jr., a guy who's got blood on his hands for his racism. Joy Reid is there, who found these tweets saying, saying, I can't believe I wrote these tweets. Wait, were they tweets? I can't remember. They were posts about, about gay people, right? They're attacking gay people. You know, that I can't believe. I'm shocked to find that I'm this person. You know, it's the silence that does it because they they don't know who we are. You want to know where this is happening to the, in the next generation is England, right? Love England, lived there for seven years. I, mean, I don't know if you've heard the story about Tommy Robinson. Now, I have to set this up, right? Tommy Robinson is an anti-Muslim activist. He is a, a kind of a, a roughneck guy from the provinces. He's not a London guy. He's, you know, he doesn't have the, the posh accent. He's, he's, a, he's a, a roughneck guy who doesn't always speak you know, in the clearest possible way. And I'm setting this up for a reason. I'm telling you this for a reason. Now, what he was doing is he was live streaming a trial for these Muslim rape gangs. That's what they are. They are Muslim rape gangs. About 80% of the people who do them are Muslim. They take little girls as young as 11, and they call them grooming gangs, which is just, I'm saying raping children gangs. Why not just call them Muslim raping children gangs? Because that's what they are, all right? And he's outside the court where they're trying some of these guys, wishfully in, before hanging them, but that's not what's going to happen. And they arrest him for violating some terms of his parole because he'd been arrested before for something else because he's an activist. And they towed him away. He gets a four minute hearing and they throw him in jail where he could be killed by Muslims. And when they said that to the, to the judge, she said, so what? That's what she said. So what? Now, they then say, oh, and by the way, you can't report on this. In England, they don't know this is going on. Right. The newspapers just scrub the reports of it right away. Now, I have to tell you, that is the British way. They can do that with a trial. They they put the rights of the people on trial before the rights of the press. That is normal there. It's wrong, but it's normal. So they do it a lot. They say, you know, you can't cover this trial. A trial will be going on and you'll hear about it from a friend who saw something about it. But the, the press won't report on it until it's over. All right. So that that part of it is part of this. But but the idea that he is the the criminal that he is the criminal. And these, after they, they themselves hid the law, law enforcement and government protected these Muslim rape gangs because they were afraid of seeming anti-Muslim. I don't think this is the end of Western civilization. I think it's the end of European civilization. I've said this before. I think Europe is dead. And I basically think these people are just eating the corpse. You know, that's all what I think is going on. But what I want to show you, the reason I was talking about the fact that uh, Tommy Robinson is kind of a roughneck, is he did an interview with, uh, oh God, Jeremy Paxton, that's his name. Now, Jeremy Paxton is one of the voices of authority over there. He's a newsman. He does the big interview shows. Uh, When I was there, I think he had a news show as well. And so he is like an authoritative uh, authoritative voice. Do we have that? Yeah, the, the, okay. And he's interviewing Tommy Robinson. So here's this authoritative, posh, elite voice interviewing this guy from the provinces. And Robinson says to him, 
basically, you don't know what's going on. You're too elite. You do are not seeing what is happening to our country. So you can make these stupid liberal arguments about these people. And you hear Paxton droning on, bringing out the old, well, not all Muslims, not all. Listen to what Tommy Robinson is telling him. And because this is the voice they want to silence, which is also the voice of Roseanne Barr, not the bigotry, not the bigotry, the love of Trump. That's the voice they want to silence. It's the voice that is not the elite voice. Listen to this. We're against Islam taken in its seventh century barbaric form. Well, which your when direct taken, quote is, I'm not against Muslims, just Islam. Against militant Islam. And when I say Islam, taken in its seventh century barbaric form. If Islam was to so, evolve, which it needs to evolve, right. to, fit in with, to fit in with Western democracy, which is clearly not, clearly there's a problem, Clearly, the English Defence League is a phenomenon that swept this country. And with, with the issues I'm talking about, Jeremy, if I ask you, do you know anyone that's hooked on heroin sold to them by Muslim gangs? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any beautiful girls that you went to school with that are now wearing a burqa that, that don't see their family? Probably don't. I do. Do you know anyone who's been murdered by a Muslim gang? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any 15-year-old girls that you know that you've grown up with that have so, been raped or pimped? You don't. So I don't expect you to all, understand the these issues. These are all personal issues of yours. Personal issues in towns and cities like mine that are happening, and they're not happening with the Sikh community, they're not happening with the Jewish community. And indeed, they're not happening with most Muslims. No, they're, 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 they're happening within the Islamic community. This is what I'm saying, that it's an Islamic problem. And, and when I'm just a simple person, so I'm just a normal person, but when I'm looking at I have to look for where this hatred is coming from. This, that's an amazing interview. I mean, he, he takes the guy apart, really, because he says you're not seeing it, and because you're not seeing it, you, you can protect yourself from feeling that you're a bad, anti-Muslim, bigoted person. You know... The thing is, the people, when they voted for Donald Trump, they were telling you something. They were talking. Why don't you listen to them? Because you want the silence. The silence helps your political point of view. It helps the elites. It helps the, the people who have risen to the top and now want to keep other people from rising to the top. It's not about Roseanne. It's not about Roseanne. She said something ugly. They want to cancel her. Put on another show with a Trump supporter. Put on two other shows because there's a lot of Trump supporters out there. Bring back Last Man Standing, release the path to 9-11. Then I'll believe that it's not just about silencing that voice as they are now doing in England using the full force of law. All right. The Lefties Dictionary. Now is the time. Now is the time. I'm, we, we've been working so hard on this. I, you know, I know a lot of people are listening, not watching. I hope you'll go on and watch because the artist did just an incredible uh, job of this. And you'll want to catch it on YouTube before it's banned for being true. A is for Antifa. Antifa is a leftist movement composed of people who violently brutalize their political opponents. Antifa stands for anti-fascist where fascist means someone who violently brutalizes his political opponents, and anti doesn't mean anything at all. Anti-fascists generally wear black masks and carry clubs and are fascists. Their purpose is to stop speeches and peaceful demonstrations by conservatives who stand for freedom and are therefore fascists to anti-fascists because anti-fascists are fascists. Thus, Antifa seeks to resist FA by being so fa that their fa is fa beyond the fa of people who are openly fa. So either way, you end up with a lot of fa. Antifa appeals to many left-wingers because they get to wear masks and terrorize people they disagree with. Of course, the Ku Klux Klan also get to wear masks and terrorize people they disagree with, but the Klan is bad because they're fa. Or maybe the Klan is Antifa. It's kind of hard to tell the difference. Some journalists also support Antifa and compare them to the brave soldiers who fought the Nazis in World War II. The historical rationale for this is that journalists are stupid. Many are also ugly. But that's neither here nor there. The important point to remember is anti-fascists believe in peace and equality and they're willing to assault and degrade anyone to get it. They justify their violence by pretending that any speech they disagree with is a form of violence which must be opposed with real violence as a form of self-expression. So in Antifa, speech is violence, and violence is speech. So no one can speak because that would be violent, so everyone's just violent, which is speech, which is violence, which is fascism, which is anti-fascism. A is for Antifa. I'm Andrew Clavin with the Lefties Dictionary. I got to say, if you're just listening to this, I, that's the first time I've seen the finished product. And that is brilliant. I, not not me. Oh, well, OK, OK, I'm brilliant, too. But <laughs> the art. Is that Cynthia did that? 
I don't know. Oh, we, we have such a great team. Cynthia is, is maybe the top artist we have, but they, we have a great team of artists back there, and that really is brilliant. Next week, we'll do B. I can't remember. What was B for? Do you remember? I, I probably have the, the script in my computers here, but well, we'll, we'll find out next week. We will be there. Uh, what is it? B is for budget? Okay. <laughs> anyway, it, I, I, love, I love these videos, and uh, that we'll be releasing one a week until we get to Z. We'll go from A to Z. The mailbag is coming up. i got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, it's probably because you haven't subscribed. If you haven't subscribed, you can't be in the mailbag. If you're not in the mailbag, you're going to have to stick, stay with your problems. We could solve all your problems for a lousy 10 bucks subscription a month. 10 bucks a month, 100 bucks for the year. You also get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. Somebody told me yesterday at UCLA that he didn't like us drinking Leftist Tears. It was too divisive, but they're just so good. I can't help it. All right, the mailbag coming up. And it's the mailbag. Yeah! <laughs> I miss Lindsay. Where, where is she? I haven't heard from her in ages. I guess the baby is, uh, is taking over her life. All right, from Keith. Yeah! Ah, I'm like, <laughs> stop it, stop it. You're just torturing me now. Uh, Keith, dear Mr. Clavin, as a lover of entertainment, particularly movies and music, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to enjoy artists whose work I respect, but who continually slander the president in the most vile ways, like Robert De Niro banning Trump from his restaurant. It's absurd. Obviously, I have no problem with entertainers having different opinions, I, and I realize most of them lean left, but it amazes me that they don't seem to care that they alienate 50% of their fan base with their blatant disrespect. I'm curious how you deal with it. Do you ever boycott certain artists even though you love their work, or do you simply just roll with it? Thanks, and I absolutely love your podcast. Thank you, uh, Keith. You know, um, I don't boycott our artists for their opinions. Uh, I will not go to a work if I just think it's going to be a boring left-wing diatribe. I mean, I remember, I, you know, I love Stephen King. Stephen King says terrible things about Trump supporters. I think he's a wonderful writer. Uh, you know, I just don't agree with his opinions. What am I, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I think that the arts are very different than, they, they do something really different than what people think they do. What people think they do is deliver kind of a message. They, they look at them as parables, but that's not true. They deliver, in my opinion, they deliver uh, the interior world of the artist by way of delivering all of our interior worlds by giving, you know, you know how towels have little nubs on them so that gives them more, um, it gives them more area so they, they can dry you better. The arts are like that. They give you more mental area so you understand life better. And so you want to hear from people you disagree with. Yeah, you, you know, I, I like uh, nihilist works. There's a movie called Open Water. It's a nihilist work. Uh, Waiting for Godot is kind of nihilist. I, you know, I, I like them because they give me a, a greater impression of the world around me and the people around me. Uh, ben and I had an argument about Get Out where he said he didn't like it because he felt it was racist. It was delivering the message that even the nice white people are bad. But I don't think that's what Get Out really delivers. What I think it delivers is the nightmare of assimilation, the nightmare that people have about assimilation, that the, the white man will steal their soul. If I assimilate, America will steal my natural Italian, Irish, black, Jewish soul, you know? And as somebody whose stole, soul was actually stolen by the greater <laughs> society because I became a Christian, I know what they're talking about. So I think I loved Get Out because it delivered that fear to me and gave me a broader perspective on humankind. And so I don't boycott people, although I will stay away from her work if I feel it's just droning left-wing propaganda. From Benjamin, Supreme Master of Words and Chief Colonizer of Mars, Clavin, I have a question on Jane Austen. Love Jane Austen. Oh, this is a great question. I'm a big fan of Pride and Prejudice, both the book and especially the 1995 BBC series. If you haven't watched it, it is spectacular. But read the book first. However, I was a little disturbed when viewing special features on the DVD version of the, lat of the latter to hear the director say that the story is basically about sex and money. I guess the idea disgusts me a little because I prefer to focus on some of the Christian ideals presented in the story. What are your thoughts on the director's statement? Thank you. Love the show. Uh, okay, you're absolutely right. But, but here's the thing. Jane Austen is one of the handful of great novelists. I think she, I really do believe she's the only great female novelist. I've said this before, that she's, she's not the only no, uh, female who has written a great novel, but she is the only novelist who stands at the heights with Tolstoy and Dickens and, all, and those guys. And there aren't that many of them, and she's one of them. Her, when you watch the movies about her, it's all about the bonnets and the coaches and the, you know, the women love the movies and all that stuff. But her books are incredibly incisive, incredibly ironic and dry and witty. And one of the things she does in observing her society is that she observes the power of money 
as it relates to the woman's role in that society of finding a husband and what it means and how it affects people and how people serve the Christian virtues, right, while living in this world of money and sex. I mean, that's the thing. So people, th- when people read her, because, because people are dumb, modern people are dumb and they think they are the first people who discovered sex and money, right? So when people read her, they're so shocked to find that it's not about the bonnets. It's not about this kind of the pretty music in the flowing fields of England. It's about this world that is filled with cynical people and mean people and bad people and is governed by money and sex and how her heroines rise above that to establish and live in the Christ, in Christian virtue. And it's all about the virtue. It's really, if you had to say, what is her theme? You would say her theme is Christian virtue. But because she observes the world so well, she observes the force of sex and money. What would she, what kind of novelist would she be if she didn't observe that? How incisive would she be? So it's really, when he says that, he's being very, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, he's miniaturizing what she's done he, down to the kind of uh, mechanics of what she does, her brilliant observations, and uh, and actually missing the greater theme. So you're right about her, but I still think he made a great show. He caught the, the spirit of it uh, in that show. Really wonderful performances. That's where Colin Firth kind of, Firth became famous uh, <laughs> as, as an actor. Uh, from Jody. Hi, Andrew. I love The Great Good Thing. And through reading it, I learned that you changed a lot over the course of time you've been married. Without compromising your wife's privacy, which I've noticed you take pains to protect, I do. Uh, can you tell us how those epic changes in you affected your marriage? Did your wife also become a Christian? Did she have to learn to love the joyful, smiling guy instead of the depressed guy she married? Just curious. I always uh, laugh that my wife married uh, a liberal Jew and is now living with a conservative Christian. And and she has been great because she is a great person. And she is a... Um, patient, flexible person. We don't uh, uh, agree about everything all the time, and that's not important to me. I'm always happy uh, to, uh, you know, talk talk to her and discuss things with her. We don't fight about it, Um, but but we don't agree on everything. She did, as I say in The Great Good Thing, it's not compromising her privacy any more than I have, but as I say in The Great Good Thing, she did uh, discover God after I found God, but before I became a Christian, if that makes sense. I found God and uh, and then she realized that this was in fact the truth. When her her mother died, she had a, an experience, a really a really powerful experience that brought her to God. And I would say yes, that she is now a Christian as well. And so that that is very helpful. Uh, but we you know we have very different approaches to it, very different viewpoints about it. But she has been incredibly flexible, and I think it's part of the. Uh, secret of our marriage that we allow each other to grow. I think it's a really important thing to do in a marriage, just speaking generally, that if, if you're if you want exactly the guy or girl you married, then how does she or he become the person he or she is supposed to be? You know, obviously, if my, the changes had been that I became an alcoholic uh, or something, you know, that would be a lot different. But it, that I became joyful and religious and uh, and, uh, you know, uh, much more realized as a human being. If you love somebody, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. You know, um, you know. I'm, it's, it's funny. I'm I'm a great believer in a male leadership in marriage. Every every good marriage I've ever seen, uh, the husband has uh, had a leadership role. But one of the things that people forget is that leadership has a purpose. The purpose of leadership is not leadership. The purpose of leadership is the good of the people you lead, right? So you want people to grow and become who they are. You want to let them free. There's no, you know, control and love don't really go well together. Anyways, uh, uh, so she has been great about it and it has been great in our marriage and for our marriage and it's been a wonderful thing all around. Um, here is a uh, here's a question about marriage, an interesting one from Justin Osage, who knows not hair upon his head. Uh, my girlfriend and I have talked about getting married and love each other to death, but we are very different people and fight constantly. I'm very traditional. She's very liberal. She's majoring in family therapy, and she bites my head off whenever I say anything that runs contrary to what she's learned in class. When we argue, it's almost always about imaginary children who don't even exist yet. When I said I think it's important to breastfeed, she said it's painful, not that important. She won't. And she doesn't want to do it. I said I wanted a wife who would stay at home to raise any young children. She said working moms are just as good as mothering moms for the child, and she doesn't want to be bored all day. We even got into a big argument about soy baby formula. She seems to aggressively disagree with any opinion I have in the domestic realm. She was abused by her mother. 
I don't know if that is part of it, but she seems to push back against my desire for traditional motherliness despite her also wanting a large family. Is it wise to continue a relationship with someone with such a disparate outlook of mine? We're both Christian, but we even manage to have very different kinds of Christianity. No, it's not wise. And it's not, this, this does not bode well for your marriage. I would not marry somebody that I was constantly fighting with. Fighting is bad, you know? I mean, people always say, experts are always saying, you know, you, you must fight in a marriage. Uh, that's absurd. I think that that is, uh, experts have their heads up their behinds, you know, that, that is ridiculous. You have to learn to disagree with each other. You have to, you do have to learn to disagree with one another and discuss things and compromise. You have to learn to do all those things, but you don't have to fight, you know, it's like, what, what, what good is that? What is yelling at the person you love, screaming at the person you love, losing your temper at the person you love? Look, some people are like that. Some people are more passionate than other people. Uh, it, passion is not the word I want. Some people are angrier and have to release all this energy. And I've seen marriages that stay together despite the fighting. Most of the fighting marriages I've seen have been bad marriages and many of them have broken up. If you are walking into everything gets more when you get married, right? I mean, if your girlfriend has a habit that annoys you, trust me, 20 years from now is going to really annoy you, all right? So if you're fighting now, this is not, and you're a fight, you are fighting about serious, basic values, things that are really important. When you have children in your life, there is no, you know, you have got to be on the same page. You cannot be fighting. You have got to give that those kids a world in which mom and dad are one thing, essentially. Maybe they're going to get a little bit more uh, motherliness from mom and a little bit more fatherliness from dad, but it's got to be a unit. This is, you're in bad shape here. You are in bad shape. And they, you know, you want to try and work it out before you go into it, fine. But in the shape you were in, if it were I, I would not go forward. I'm just telling you. You know, you asked me, so I'm telling you. Uh, from Jeremiah, AK it's, no, AK, it's no secret that the Daily Wire is highly critical of the left, and with good reason, they're idiots. My question revolves around just that. Are they really just idiots and incredibly misinformed, or do you think they are deeply corrupt and nefarious individuals that have evil and selfish agendas to undermine American values and principles? You know, I, I think, obviously, on both sides, there are evil people, and I do think that uh, the 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 closer they come to socialism and communism, the closer they come to embracing something that results in evil. I don't think, unfortunately, in life, it doesn't it doesn't take evil people to do evil. You know, I was talking about this last night at UCLA. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And when you think about that expression, it's a very powerful expression. It's the road to hell. It is the road to the worst place. And it's paved with good intentions. As I said yesterday, you'd think it would be paved with the smoking skulls of infidels, which would at least be attractive, you know, kind of, kind of cool. But it's paved with good intentions. So I think there are a lot of people on the left with good intentions. I think there are a lot of people who trust their feelings instead of the facts. I think Ben is right about this. And I think that you really do have to step back and see the greater thing. I mean, this thing about socialism, you know, this idea that will not die. And, you know, it's based on the idea that things can be free. They say, well, free health care. You say, well, nothing's free. So who's paying for it? And is it right? If I get sick and I go to my neighbor's house and point a gun in his face and say, pay for my doctor, is that right? Because that's essentially what is going on. And they say, well, what about Norway, where they've never been? You know, I'm sure that Bernie Sanders has never been to Norway. The things are great in Norway. Well, first of all, Norway is not a socialist country. It has a free market. It has a lot of a much higher rate of social spending. OK, as a result of that, people in Norway are happier than people in America. But. They are living in our garage, right? Do they use cell phones? They were invented under capitalism. Do they use cars? Under capitalism. Do they use computers? They were invented under capitalism. Do they have an army that defends Norway? No, they know they won't be invaded because our army will defend them. They live off capitalism and people don't think about it. They don't, they trust their emotions. It sounds fair. It sounds nice. Yeah, hundred million people were killed under communism, but you know, it still sounds fun. So I think a lot of people are just deluded and, uh, you know, any, anyway, that, that is basically it, because a lot of people are just voting. There's two choices. One of them is saying nice things. One of them is saying harsh sounding things. So um, from Caleb, a two part question from the one part supreme overlord of all things noble and one part bulwark against the exterior darkness. What would you say to a Jew while witnessing to him? Also, what are the differences between the Jewish vision of heaven and the Christian view? Much obliged, a one-part Clavin fan with room for Shapiro and Knowles. We always joke here that the first person to convert Shapiro goes straight to heaven. Like, it's just like, like you know, Elijah going, bang, you just take take off. But, but you know, we, we got into a discussion the other day. Man, should I say this? Yeah. But, uh, you know, we got into a discussion the other day where we were joking around about Jews getting to heaven because I believe that God has a you know, special, the Catholics believe this too, that there's a special dispensation for Jews and they, you know, they, they in fact, 
in, in the circumstances where they will be permitted into heaven, they will be permitted into heaven. And I said, of course, we have to accept Shapiro. Nobody's going to let Shapiro into heaven. I said, because if you have Shapiro in heaven, he would say things like, well, things are fine for eternity, but after that, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> no, we, we, are, we are taking Shapiro to heaven. We are going to link arms with Shapiro and carry him to heaven, no matter what anybody says. We're taking him with us. I don't witness to people in that sense. I do not preach to people. because Why? Because I don't think it works. I think it's offensive. You know, I think it offends people and puts them off. If I'm trying to sell the kingdom of God, why would I preach to people? Why would I say your religion is bad, mine is good? I try to live so that it matters to people. I'm willing to discuss it with anybody who wants to discuss it with me. I try to point out you know, if, if I'm in that discussion, I try to point out where my values are connected to my Christian faith. But, you know, my job, if my job is to spread Christianity, preaching to people is the worst way to do it, right? Why would I do it if it doesn't work? Okay, so that's that's my idea. Uh, you know, the, the Jewish vision of heaven is, is has changed and is very complex, and different people have different ideas of heaven. Uh, there was an there was is a vision of uh, heaven in in the Old Testament of the, uh, the afterlife in the Old Testament. But I, I think both in the Gospels, Old and New Testament, it's very vague. It is very vague. The one thing we know about Christianity, which remember comes out of Judaism and all its thoughts that at the beginning were Jewish thoughts, is that we know you get a new body. And that's very important because the people who think of the soul as uh, just this kind of ghostly thing um, you know, like Casper, the friendly ghost, the ghost in the machine. That's not the Christian way of talking. You get, it, there is a resurrection of the body. You get a, a, a fresh body. The, you know, I, I'm not really an expert on the Jewish idea of heaven. I really don't have, because uh, it, different people have different ideas. And there are some Jews who don't even believe in an afterlife. And that's still within the bounds of Judaism. So I'll, I'll ask Shapiro next time I see him, when I see him in heaven, I'll, I'll ask him. Um, tickety boo news. We got to move on. So love this headline from CNN, from CNN's website, right, by Jesse Williams, an actor, activist, and Advancement Project board member, and Judith Brown Deanis, an executive director of the Advancement Project. Starbucks incident proves whites only spaces still exist. I mean, this that that is got to be great. The Starbucks threw out a couple of trespassers, and they have been. They have been playing the prisoner at a Stalinist show trial ever since. They've been apologizing because they were black. The people they threw out were black. They didn't want to pay. They told the police. They, they said on TV, oh, they were wrongly arrested. They weren't wrongly arrested. The police asked them to leave because they weren't buying anything. They refused a directive from the police. So the police arrested them, took them out, didn't charge them with anything, let them go. So they keep saying, now Starbucks closed for like three hours to train their people not to be biased. They couldn't do it after hours. They couldn't, you know, they closed the store so you couldn't get a cup of coffee. <laughs> but they train their people. But this proves that whites only spaces still exist. And while Starbucks was closed, these writers say, you know, people are struggling without their usual coffee fix. But there's another segment of Americans who are suffering, too people of color who must constantly face having their very presence in public spaces challenged by white Americans and the police, which is, by the way, if that's true, the people you should blame are the people of color who are committing crimes because the, the kind, what the police are doing is they're going off the stats. They are saying, you know, a person who looks like this in this neighborhood doing this very high likelihood that this guy should move on. I'm going to move him on. It's a shame. It's a shame that innocent people get uh, you know, moved on for that or pulled over or whatever, but it ain't the fault of the police. The police are just trying to protect people of all colors. The people the police protect are of all colors. They are trying to protect them, not knowing. Look, if there were a little light, if they had a machine that made a little light when you were going to commit a crime, the police would never arrest nice black people. They'd never harass nice black people. It's not the blackness they're after. It is the statistics that caused by black criminals that make Good, the, the majority of black people who are law-abiding make them look bad. You know, this thing about racism in America, which I just think is a support of the left, why do they keep it alive? I get to ask this a lot, and I kind of got asked it yesterday at UCLA. After World War II, when the Holocaust was exposed and the racism of German society was exposed, the good people, like America, took a fresh look at some of the racism in our society, put a racism in a new light. And it brought racism to the fore, the way black people was be, were being treated, which was unfair. And it caused a lot of shame, which is a very painful emotion. A lot of what people do in life is to avoid shame. And it caused people to reflect 
on America. Because remember, when I was raised, you said the Pledge of Allegiance, you sang uh, the national anthem, you know, you were taught that America was the greatest country on earth. That's what you were taught in school. And suddenly we found out, you know, that there was a segment of Americans who by other Americans, we're being treated badly by other Americans. And the shame moved people to hysteria so that, because shame is just a powerful emotion. And that, I think, is one of the things that torched the 60s, made people turn against America and made people say that whatever America is doing, it's the other guys who are right. You're fighting communism, the communists must be right. You're fighting, you know, the, the Viet Cong, the Viet Cong must be good people. That was Hanoi Jane going over there wa- waving the Viet Cong flag. They're doing it today. You you hate MS-13, MS-13 filled with divinity, the spark of divinity, the loveliest people on earth. They, they're doing it to this very day. They haven't gotten over the shame. And they know it inspires this in people. They know it inspires people. And people will do anything to avoid shame. They keep calling you racist, even though this country is, is one of the now one of the least, it, it may be the least racist country on earth. In my experience, it's the least racist country I've ever been in. And I've been in a lot of countries. It may be, the, but they want to keep that alive because it's what turns people against the country. It's what turns them to the left. It what's, it's what turns them to the hatred of Western society, which is now at the core of leftism. That socialist, communist idea where all the power ends up in the hands of the elites. All the power ends up in the hands of people just like the people who run the New York Times. That is what they do. So they, if they can keep convincing you that America is racist. You will keep experiencing that shame and keep turning away from the West. America is no longer a racist country. You go to Starbucks, buy a damn cup of coffee, and you won't get thrown out, all right? Starbucks has really made a terrible, terrible uh, uh, decision in, in letting them do this. The Lefties Dictionary releases every other week. All right, so it's every other week, two more weeks to be to be or not to be. We don't know yet. We'll find out. All right. I'm on my way to New York for Knowles' wedding, which actually I am celebrating. I'm celebrating for Knowles. You know, I'm sad, sad for Alyssa, happy for Knowles. And, uh, but I will broadcast tomorrow from New York. I'll see you then. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Emily Jai. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.